Hi, and welcome everyone to CASA's hour. Uh, we are going to do a bit of a review on some of the uh, policies and events happening in the United States. Uh, if you were watching some of the pre-recorded comment leading up to this, uh, as Derek Yak uh, noted, uh, our Food and Drug Administration has uh, a notable influence on policies around the world. And so uh, we figured it would be uh, a good contribution to the, the scope event here uh, to provide some review uh, as to things that have gone on in the United States and, and how that might be affecting folks around the world. So without further ado, uh, if we could bring on uh, Danielle Jones, my co-panelist for the next hour. Hi, Danielle. Hello. How's it going? I'm well, how are you? I'm hanging in there. <laughs> And hello to everyone watching. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've got an hour to cram in a bunch of stuff here. So um, maybe we'll get started. Um, now, uh, Danielle, uh, I'm going to be asking Danielle about the, mass, the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement, and then we'll swap roles here, and, and she'll ask me some stuff about FDA. Um, and so uh, for those of you who don't know what the Master Settlement Agreement is, um, Danielle, maybe you could uh, help people understand, first of all, uh, why should consumers in the United States care about the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement? Sure. So we'll get into pretty intensely what exactly it is. Um, but the reason that people should care that it exists is uh, simply because context matters, right? Uh, so the Master Settlement Agreement, or we abbreviate and call it the MSA, uh, plays a role in the history and motivations of the players involved in tobacco control and regulation in the United States, and money can talk very loudly, right? So these are important things to, to consider. And so um, obviously, uh, you know, something specific to the United States, but why should the rest of the world care about this? So in the same way that we care about countries with, let's say, state-owned tobacco, you know, companies where the, the government actually has a vested interest, we also need to care about other financial ties between tobacco companies and the government uh, in the United States. So because, again, context and motivations. So um, when, when did the MSA begin? Okay, so starting in the 1950s, um, people in America began trying to sue tobacco companies in the United States because smoking was causing people to become sick and die prematurely. Um, but because tobacco companies are incredibly rich and powerful and resourceful, uh, the majority of these lawsuits failed. In the 1990s, the attorneys general of several states came up with the idea to sue the tobacco companies in order to recover Medicaid and other health-related costs. Uh, this tactic actually proved successful, uh, and as the big tobacco companies wound up settling with four individual states in 1997 and eventually agreed to the full MSA, which effectively was a settlement with all other remaining U.S. states, plus some of the districts and territories, um, and it was formally signed in 1998. So I, I think you, you, you touched on it a little bit, but why exactly was the MSA necessary? So it, at the time, uh, it was the only legal tactic that effectively got tobacco companies to pay for the death and disease their products caused, and the only way to put marketing and advertising restrictions on them at that time. Today, the FDA regulates tobacco companies and has the power to limit marketing and advertising, but back then the FDA didn't have this power. Um, and other attempts to limit tobacco companies butted up against um, America's First Amendment rights issues. So with the MSA, the tobacco companies actually voluntarily signed on to these restrictions. So there weren't any First Amendment issues. So, um, yeah, we are an overly litigious country, as, as many may be aware of. But uh, how is the MSA any different from all of the other lawsuits against tobacco companies? So the primary difference was that it was actually effective, right? We talked about all of the other lawsuits failing. Um, so that's probably the biggest difference is that it actually was effective. But the prior suits uh, were from individuals uh, as opposed to governments, and they were against the companies for damages related to the effects of smoking. Um, but the tobacco companies beat back most of these suits using defenses like contributory negligence and individual responsibility of the people who smoke. So the legal arguments used by the states, uh, which ultimately led to the MSA, were about consumer protection, antitrust, and recouping healthcare costs. So the healthcare costs argument was the one that worked the best, and that forced the tobacco companies to settle uh, with the first four states, which were Mississippi, Minnesota, Florida, and Texas. 
So um, we've got some of the players involved here, but what are the details of the settlement agreement? So these were lawsuits at, at their core. That's what we have to remember. And so the settlement agreement was essentially a settlement in a lawsuit like any other lawsuit. And so as with most lawsuit settlements, the primary thing that the MSA does is that it requires the participating tobacco companies to pay state governments a portion of their revenue in perpetuity, so forever. Uh, as a consequence of that, this also increased the price of cigarettes they sold um, in order to offset the cost. And as I said, it also implemented marketing and advertising restrictions. So, you know, how how much money is the master settlement agreement extracting from ultimately consumers here? <laughs> yeah. So the MSA is the single largest civil litigation settlement in U.S. history, right? Uh, so to date, tobacco companies have paid state governments over $160 billion, that's a billion with a B, uh, and that number grows every year because the tobacco companies continue to make annual payments and they will do so forever. I know and this is this is a bit of a, uh, this is not a question that we, re we rehearsed, but you know, we recently had uh, a lot of coverage about uh, opioids in the United States and opioid manufacturers um, and not being subject to a master settlement agreement, but um, certainly settlements, um, right. you know, by comparison, do you know how much uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies are being uh, asked to pay uh, in, in some of these lawsuits? Off the top of my head, I don't remember the figures, uh, but I remember seeing them in the news and thinking, oh, they got off easy compared to like the tobacco companies. Um, I, th I want to say it was in like, Mil I want to say some millions. I'm not, don't quote me on this, but I know it was substantially less than what tobacco companies. Some, uh, some partially millions. Because, yeah, some millions is my understanding. Um, it might have been a couple billion. I'm not, I'm not, don't quote me on that. But compared to, the problem is those were, those are essentially fixed, if I'm to understand correctly, fixed payments. With the MSA, these payments go forever for as long as the companies are, are solvent, essentially. Um, and so that's just going to continue to rack up money. I don't see any other agreement, you know, surpassing that just because it goes on forever. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, ultimately, uh, the, the point being not only is it currently the uh, largest settlement in American history, but likely to continue being the largest settlement. Um, so uh, now that we got all the money out of the way, uh, w which companies are actually included in this agreement? So the original agreement uh, back in the 90s was with four tobacco companies. So that was Philip Morris, RJ Reynolds, uh, Brown and Williamson, and Lorillard. However, since then, over 40 more tobacco companies have also been included. So uh, for these additional companies, how, how did they come to be included in the law? They weren't originally named, so how did they get added? Correct. That's the interesting part about this is one would imagine, you know, if these four companies were the ones that were sued, how did everybody else get involved? Uh, and the strange answer is they voluntarily signed on, which seems bizarre uh, until you understand that they were essentially extorted into doing so. Uh, so the original four tobacco companies who were sued and settling knew that they'd have to raise the price of their cigarettes in order to compensate for the loss of money from paying the states. And they argued that this would give their competitors an unfair advantage in the market. Uh, so they negotiated a clause into the MSA that allowed them to pay the states less money if they lost market share to their competitors that weren't included in the settlement and therefore didn't have to pay the money. So this essentially created a very strong incentive for the states themselves to help make sure that that didn't happen. So they were encouraged to pass their own legislation uh, requiring any tobacco company who wanted to sell in their state to either join the MSA voluntarily or also to make similar payments to the states, resulting also in higher cigarette prices, which effectively leveled the playing field. Um, there were additional incentives if companies joined early. Uh, it was very much like a, a marketing, you know, like join in the first 90 days and you won't have to pay, you know, this sort of thing. But they essentially said, you either pay me this way or you pay me that way, but you're going to pay. And the majority of them, it was actually a better deal if they signed on voluntarily early. And so, like I said, over 40 of them did. So I know this, my next uh, question really, again, not something that we rehearsed, but something you are uh, intimately familiar with. 
Um, first of all, for the international audience, uh, for, for more information uh, on the MSA and, and to take a look at Danielle's uh, handiwork, um, Google up the uh, truth about vaping videos. Uh, and of course, the most recent installment looks at the potential of a, uh, a master settlement agreement for vaping. And so uh, if, if anybody is sort of curious about what effect that will have on, first of all, consumers, but uh, the, the broader industry beyond just one company um, and something that you touch on, uh, we could be looking at a similar situation where uh, there's some arm twisting at the state level and vapor companies that have nothing to do with uh, perhaps Juul's poor marketing decisions uh, or you know, other things that have really just been hyped up and, and, and uh, made much bigger than they actually are, um, that they would also have to sign on to something like this, correct? Right. So, you know, the way that the master settlement agreement got started, right, is that states were suing tobacco companies. Well, right now, if you've been paying attention to the news in the United States, states and a lot of other people as well are suing Juul. And so that's that's how this gets started. Right. And so if you know, and my video gets into this, if you want an in-depth analysis, but if you if Juul perchance wanted to get rid of these lawsuits all in one foul swoop, for example, they might consider something like a master settlement agreement. Because there are, I believe, over two or 3,000 different lawsuits against Juul right now. It, it's getting insane. And so this is sort of creating the type of environment, uh, you know, following the same playbook, if you will, um, that ultimately led to the master settlement agreement with tobacco companies and cigarettes. So there is a chance, and tobacco control activists have definitely made it known that they would love to see uh, a master settlement type agreement with the vaping industry stemming from these jewel lawsuits. So it is a possibility that is out there. A lot of it depends on what happens with the lawsuit and what jewel ultimately decides to do. And, and as far as, you know, tobacco control organizations, motivations or, or glee at uh, taking money from uh, uh, a vapor company now, um, uh, I guess it's, it's, I don't know that if you, if you mentioned, I don't think you mentioned it, but, uh, one of the things that came out of the master settlement agreement was, uh, the American legacy foundation, which is now the truth initiative. Right. And so, and, and these are, uh, organizations that receive all kinds of, you know, not just money from Bloomberg, but, but grants and, and funding from, from other places. I'm not entirely clear on how much of that comes from MSA settlement money. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if that is there, then certainly a motivation for them to, to go after vapor companies. Right. So besides monetary penalties, the MSA also imposed some other things on tobacco companies. So um, it was the marketing advertising restrictions like we talked about. It did fund the creation of um, what we know as the Truth or uh, the Truth Initiative, but it was originally American Legacy Foundation. And how that worked is, I believe, so MSA funds were only used to to initially like start it up. I want to say it may have been somewhere between like three or five years worth of the initial you know first funding. Since then, uh, Truth no longer takes uh, MSA money. They no longer receive MSA money, but they were you know, founded uh, with, if you will, a grant or, you know, a lot of funding uh, from the MSA. At this point, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the majority of their funding comes from uh, very apparently smart investments that they have made with a lot of the, the money that they've collected. Um, but yeah, it, um, it funded them. Uh, and then it also required tobacco companies to release uh, a ton of previously secret internal documents and memos uh, that provided you know, evidence of their tactics and strategies. And so a lot of intel and what a lot of tobacco control organizations talk about, you know, the big tobacco playbook, a lot of that comes from these uh, secret documents. I believe there's one, if not several, you know, libraries dedicated to all of these documents. Yeah, certainly a, a gold mine that they keep. Uh, I'm going to mix my metaphors here, but they keep going back to that well. Of course, uh, I think several years ago we saw them recycling a, a memo that is in the tobacco files, uh, uh, the, the replacement smokers memo, uh, I believe written in 1983 by someone who no longer works at that company and may or may not still be alive. Um, right. But uh, but yeah, it's a, certainly a treasure trove for all of them. So. Um, uh, finally here, um, does the master settlement agreement actually make cigarettes more expensive? 
In effect, yes. It's not technically written into the agreement, but essentially if costs for a company go up, they typically pass that cost onto their consumers, right? So that's essentially what happens here. And tobacco control activists love to like tout how they made cigarettes more expensive with the MSA. But it, I mean, the tobacco companies didn't have to do that, but they did in order to preserve their profits. So because they had to pay the states or they have to pay the states so much money annually, they, you know, compensated because they still want profit. Um, so they raised the price of cigarettes to, to compensate for that. All right. Well, I, I hope uh, hope we at least uh, got some people curious and, and interested in what uh, the MSA is and, and also hopefully answered some questions. Um, certainly, this is something that's uh, replicatable in other places. Uh, so um, hopefully that was informative. And now, Danielle, I, I passed the, the conch shell to you and uh, fire away. <laughs> so now we're going to ask Alex about uh, the FDA and sort of a brief overview of how the FDA uh, regulates vaping, why that happened, the PMTA process, et cetera. So Alex, my first question for you is how and when did the FDA come to regulate vapor products? So um, a little bit of uh, very brief background here. 2009 was a big year for uh, the Food and Drug Administration uh, in that in that same year, we had uh, Congress grant FDA the authority to regulate tobacco products, and FDA took enforcement action against vapor companies importing e-cigs to the United States. Uh, and uh, FDA basically directed customs to seize these shipments at the port, uh, and uh, they were being seized because allegedly, according to FDA, these companies were marketing them as smoking cessation products. Uh, which immediately puts you into FDA's drug and device and therapeutic, uh, all that jurisdiction. Uh, and so uh, in 2009, also the FDA was sued by those companies. Uh, this was Soterra, Smoking Everywhere, and I forget which one of those was actually Enjoy. Um, and uh, this all came to a conclusion in 2010. Uh, when the judge ruled that as long as e-cigarettes were not sold as smoking cessation therapies, then FDA didn't have any jurisdiction over them. Uh, but, and this is the judge's opinion, not the ruling, a lot of people get this confused that the judge, uh, you know, demanded that they be regulated as tobacco or that, that, that the court ruled that they had to be. Uh, that was not the case. The judge's opinion was that if the FDA were to pursue regulations, uh, it would probably be under their newly granted tobacco authority. Uh, and so that is what played out over the next several years. Uh, it would be four more years in 2014 before the FDA published its uh, draft deeming rule. Uh, and deeming is a process by which, by through, through rulemaking, uh, the FDA could deem uh, certain products to be tobacco products uh, as long as they are consistent with the statute made or derived from tobacco. Uh, and so this, this includes all kinds of uh, other tobacco products that weren't in the original Tobacco Control Act, um, which is, that's what we've been talking about. The Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act is what gives FDA their regulatory authority over tobacco. Um, and so this, right down to the nicotine that we use in e-liquids, um, all of that is made or derived from tobacco, except for the synthetic stuff. Uh, and that falls under FDA's tobacco regulatory authority. Um, so in 2014, the draft rule was published. There was a comment period. I encourage everyone to check out uh, CASA's uh, e-cigarette timeline. In fact, if you just type that into Google, it'll take you right there, e-cigarette timeline. Uh, it should be in the top, the top result or the top three results. Um, and there's uh, a bit more detail. You can see all of the comments that were submitted and, and I've, uh, of course, direct your attention to Kassah's comment. Uh, Dr. Carl Phillips uh, pretty much wrote that, uh, and a, a privilege, uh, my privilege to even you know tag along and, and edit some things uh, in 2014 when I first joined the board of directors. Um, but it is a fantastic comment. Uh, unfortunately, FDA did not heed the warning. And in 2016, the deeming regulations were finalized and published in the Federal Register on May 10th. Uh, 510 for those of you keeping score at home. Uh, and uh, they were pretty much identical to what we saw in 2014. And so that brings us uh, close to where we are today 
uh, where FDA is requiring uh, pre-market tobacco applications in order for companies to keep their products on the market. Thank you for that brief history. And so, <laughs> as you mentioned, this has been going on for quite a while, right? Since yeah. 2010 planning, even before then. But uh, let me ask you, what has happened in the last two years um, that is related to this regulatory process, right? It seems like things have been heating up a lot. So I just wanted us to cover, you know, what recently has been happening. Yeah, so I'll go once again back a little bit further than two years. Uh, in 2017, uh, this is a, a year before uh, this 2018 deadline that was established in the deeming rule. Uh, the FDA came out and made an announcement and said that they were pushing the deadline for smoke-free new nicotine products uh, back to 2022. And this effectively gave uh, the industry, uh, most importantly, the independent side of the industry, four more years to work on their applications. However, uh, as is the case in the United States, somebody's got to sue. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics sued the FDA to, uh, at the time, retroactively enforce the August 8th, 2018 deadline. Uh, I believe the lawsuit was filed in 2019. Um, I, I sometimes get that confused. It could have been late 2018 when it was, when it was filed. Uh, forgive me, I'm not having the specific date. But the point is that they wanted retroactive enforcement of this. Uh, meaning they wanted all of these products wiped off the market. Uh, and so as a result of that lawsuit in uh, 2019, uh, the court uh, came to a conclusion uh, that the deadline would be moved up to May of 2020. Uh, in fact, FDA asked for a 10-month delay in, in setting this deadline, uh, ostensibly to allow a few companies more time to complete a more robust application. Uh, FDA did not want to have this deadline come and go without authorizing something or denying a bunch of things. Uh, but of course the pandemic happened. Uh, and as a result, uh, there were certainly a lot of bottlenecks throughout the world uh, in a lot of these companies trying to get to labs, to get testing done, to get the, you know, all the studies and research they needed to do to have a, a robust application. Uh, and with the pandemic on top of that, uh, everything was getting bogged down, especially at FDA. Uh, and so the deadline was pushed back to September of 2020. Uh, and then uh, the FDA had a year to review all the applications that were received. Uh, there were hundreds, several hundred applications for six and a half million products uh, is, is sort of the final count there. Um, and so, as of this past September, uh, what we have seen uh, was, uh, of course, FDA was expected to authorize and or deny applications on September 9th of 2021. Leading up to that deadline, we saw waves of or, uh, marketing denial orders go out. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that it was for pretty much all of the denial orders were for flavors other than tobacco. Uh, and so uh, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but uh, so far, the FDA has authorized one product, and that is the Views Solo, uh, which is an early generation device. And I know that you've, you've brought this up a couple of times. How, how easy is it to get a hold of the Views Solo? Uh, I had a friend who was searching all over Southern California for one, and I think it took about a week or two and finally convinced a shop owner to special order it for him so that he could try it. So my understanding is, I believe they have, according to Nielsen data, I think they have like less than 1% of the market share. It is not a very, I mean, that was their initial, I believe it was their initial um, product that was put out in like 2012, 2014, somewhere in there. And the Views Alto is their more popular product, which I believe is still pending PMTA, you know, review. Um, but the Solo, not a very popular product. Yeah. Yeah, that was, a, that was a Reynolds product. And again, one of those sort of things that we point to uh, quite a bit here when, when people say that this is just a big tobacco uh, driven product category. Um, here you, here you go. The Views Solo introduced maybe 2012, at least four years after people started DIYing their own e-liquids in, in their kitchens and, and building mods out of um, uh, guitar pedals and whatever else you could find at the hardware store. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, yeah. 
So what is the uh, perceived likelihood of success been for small businesses applying, you know, putting their PMTA applications in? So uh, again, I will direct you to uh, the comments on our e-cigarette timeline for some more detailed commentary about this. Uh, but from the, the time that the deeming rule was published uh, to present, uh, and even as far back as the draft rule in 2014, um, the perceived likelihood of success of small businesses applying for PMTA is slim to none. Uh, the FDA sort of threw a number out there that applications could cost 150 to like $325,000 or something like that. I don't, I don't know where they came up with that number. Um, but just for reference, I think Turning Point Brands uh, put uh, more than $20 million into their application. Uh, and this was, a, this was an application that was originally denied. Um, but we'll get back. We'll get back into that a little bit later. So, slim to none chance of making it because, as you mentioned, it's incredibly expensive and difficult. Can you get into some of the details about why it's so ridiculous? Sure. Um, so, uh, the initial estimates from FDA. Uh, first of all, I, I don't think they accounted for what has ended up being this sort of uh, the 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 switcheroo that was pulled on manufacturers with, uh, you know, halfway through reviewing, not even halfway through reviewing, just in the middle of reviewing applications, the FDA basically started denying these applications because they didn't contain product specific randomized control trials or longitudinal studies, um, which I've never priced that out because I've never been required to get one for anything, but I imagine they're quite expensive not to mention all of the lab testing involved. And people who are familiar with the products know that these are, when you're talking about one flavor in one nicotine strength, that's one application. And so just run the range of nicotine strengths that you see in one flavor and you need data for each one of those. And then think about what each manufacturer actually makes uh, in terms of the number of, of different flavors, perhaps they are, you know, co-packers out there who are manufacturing for different brands. Each one of those nicotine strengths and flavors is its own application with its own specific data. And all of that, each one of those costs an, an exorbitant amount of money all put together. Um, and, you know, in addition to putting the application together, uh, companies have to make investments in terms of, you know, good manufacturing practices, uh, they need to uh, do post-market surveillance. Uh, something that people may not understand is that, uh, you know, market authorizations are not carved in stone. Uh, these, are, these can be revoked at any time by FDA if a company steps out of line. And so uh, it, it is in the best interest of all of these applicants to have a very clear and robust marketing plan. Uh, that takes money to develop, it takes money to implement, uh, and it takes money to stick by that. Uh, and so all of these costs um, far, I, I mean, it, it's just, it's bigger than the application itself. The expenses continue on well past getting market authorization, if you can even get to that point. Oh, yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's enough to, you know, make you dizzy, essentially. So yeah. with all of this, considering the cost and the difficulty and everything involved in this pathway that's been created, how many tobacco products have actually been authorized by the FDA as of now? So, sorry, I needed a, a sip of water there. <clears throat> um, so we have, uh, I believe, a half a dozen, half a dozen, almost half a dozen uh, products. Actually, it's more than that because uh, Swedish Match was the first company to get across the finish line here with eight snooze products, which include mint and wintergreen. Um, this, of course, uh, happening because their, their application showed that marketing these products is appropriate for the protection of public health. That, that didn't seem to impress uh, the, the Board of Commissioners in, in the city of San Francisco. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the FDA has already approved flavors other than tobacco as appropriate for the protection of public health. Um, Altria uh, gained a marketing authorization for ICOS, the heat not burn product. And once again, uh, in flavors other than tobacco, just mint, but uh, nonetheless, uh, a flavor. Uh, 22nd century makers of very low nicotine content cigarettes also received a PMTA 
However, the company has vowed to not market it until they get a modified risk order. Um, Reynolds, as we mentioned recently, gained the first market authorization for a vapor product for the Views Solo that nobody uses. Uh, and then there is another one that I've never tried. I've seen pictures of it. It sounds interesting, but also weird. And that uh, is Verve from U.S. Smokeless Tobacco Company. It is described as a chewy, non-gum nicotine disc. Appetizing. <laughs> Very. Um, so of all of these products, what is actually available to consumers, right? We have this insane pathway. It's taken us years to get here. We only have a handful of things that have been actually authorized by FDA. Let's narrow it down even more and let us know which ones are actually even purchasable. So probably the thing that Americans are most likely to find is going to be the, the general snus products. Um, it's not sold everywhere. Um, I have not, it's not sold in the gas station down the street from me, although Zinn is, um, but that's, that hasn't received a marketing order just yet. Um, and I think, uh, there was an article about, uh, the nicotine pouches using synthetic nicotine. Um, so that may buy them a little bit of time. Um, so yeah, general snus is probably the most likely to find. Uh, ICOS, uh, we're expecting that at the result of a patent infringement lawsuit, ICOS will no longer be sold in the United States as of this month, November. Um, but previously, uh, it is currently being sold or was being sold in uh, just four states, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. Um, we're not exactly sure how that whole patent infringement thing is going to play out. Apparently, if they can manufacture it domestically, then they'll be uh, able to, to sell it here. It's all about an import ban. Um, and as I mentioned, 22nd Century isn't marking their product until they get a modified risk order. And as we discussed, uh, View Solo is very hard to find. So um, yeah, if you're out there looking for a modified risk tobacco product that the FDA has given its blessing to, uh, General Snus is probably the, the one thing that you're gonna be able to find. Right. And I think we, we discovered that the strange Verve chewy non-gum nicotine discs were discontinued, uh, I believe, in 2019. So good luck finding that one. Yeah, which is unfortunate because I am known and, and do enjoy sometimes putting weird things in my mouth. So Chewy discs uh, for the win. That's right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, We've seen some discussion about this, and I just want to briefly touch on what is the difference between FDA authorizing something and approving? We've seen a little bit of a disconnect, um, especially in the media on this topic. So I wondered if you could just cover this quickly. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure at like a, a codified level within FDA, there's a way to explain this in a very dry and legal sounding way. Um, but just as a sort of a practical way to make a distinction, when people hear the phrase FDA approved, uh, that is typically referencing drugs or devices, therapeutic drugs or devices, uh, and FDA approval carries that that message of this is this is safe for you to use. Um, and so we have to make that distinction between what FDA approves and what FDA authorizes for sale. Uh, FDA is never going to come out and say that any tobacco product is is safe for use. Um, rather, that the marketing is appropriate for the protection of the public health and that these products are indeed authorized for sale. Got it. Um, so there are currently 28 plus, probably and counting companies um, suing FDA because lawsuits uh, over their PMTA applications, namely their denial, marketing denial orders. Can you talk briefly about what is going on there and why that's happening? Sure. Um, so as we mentioned uh, not that long ago, just a few minutes ago, uh, it seems that FDA has um, uh, established a, a new standard part of the way through part of the way through reviewing uh, these applications. Um, and uh, so what these companies are suing for is that they're they're uh, they're challenging the marketing denial orders and asking for a stay through the court or. Uh, for FDA to rescind the marketing order. So the stay basically stops FDA from taking enforcement action. Uh, rescinding the marketing denial order should put their application back into review. Um, and so uh, 
what's happened and why companies are actually being granted these stay orders or having their MDOs rescinded um, is that FDA appears to have uh, summarily or uh, in, a, in a wholesale way rejected applications for vapor products in flavors other than tobacco. Uh, and they did this by way of conducting a what's known as a fatal flaw uh, review. And so uh, the fatal flaw, according to FDA, were uh, was a, a lack of product-specific RCTs, randomized control trials, uh, or longitudinal data. Um, in, in, in my opinion, uh, and, and I, I'm sure other people share this, and I can't actually claim ownership of this opinion, um, but uh, this appears that it vi this, this action violates FDA's mandate to conduct thorough scientific review. Uh, and another way to look at this is contempt prior to investigation, which will not fail to keep man in everlasting darkness. Um, a little AA quote there for you. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, this, this attitude might be embedded arguably in the Tobacco Control Act, uh, but it is not plainly written. It is not codified. Uh, and so uh, clearly FDA has, has, has violated something here. Um, and uh, so yeah, I, 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 I've mentioned this several times in that they had implemented this standard uh, after the application deadline came and went. Uh, and uh, our our Fifth Circuit, it was at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, in 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 rendering their ruling on the uh, Wages and White Lion case, uh, referred to this as, uh, as FDA pulling a switcheroo on the industry. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's uh, that that shouldn't have happened. It's a it's a pretty good legal document for anybody out there interested in reading it. Um, just look up wages and white lion versus FDA, and it should come right up. Uh, so, uh, what we've been learning through this process of companies suing the FDA is that several of these companies, actually a lot of companies, actually did submit robust applications. Uh, Turning Point Brands, as I mentioned earlier, was sort of the first indication of some, some malfeasance on the part of FDA here. Uh, uh, Turning Point Brands actually did include uh, studies that would qualify as a longitudinal study uh, and some clinical trials uh, specific to the products they were seeking an application or seeking, seeking approval authorization for. Um, and uh, another one, again, Wages and White Lion. Uh, included uh, as part of their application a very clear marketing plan. Uh, again, this is this is something that's required. You have to develop a marketing cl plan. You have to stick to it. Uh, and Wages and White Lion, uh, th their commitment is to only do business with retailers who uh, are adult only access. So in the United States, that's 21 and up. Uh, and these are these are not products that you would ordinarily find in a convenience store to begin with. Uh, but here we have a company as part of their application committing to sell it in adult-only establishments. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty galling to think about, you know, they, they put out the deeming rule in 2014, right? That was the first draft of them saying, there's going to be a pathway that we're making for this. And they make what is essentially a new rule, and they wait to come up with it or decide that it's what they're going to base their findings on until after the deadline for submission has passed in 2020 and in the middle of, I mean, I, when I explain this to people, I, t I think of it like, okay, you have a study guide for a test, right? And you follow the study guide and you study and you prep for the test and then you take your quiz. And then in the middle of your teacher grading it, they decide that they're going to add questions that weren't on the study guide after you already took the test and then, you know, mark off points on your test because you didn't answer the question they're adding while they're grading. That's that's my bad analogy for the day. <laughs> no, I think that works uh, perfectly. Um, and then I, you know, throw in a dash of politics. You know, we've seen, you know, again, I, I don't know that we can, we can beat this into the ground, but you know, this is supposed to be a scientific review. There, there's nobody's campaign, nobody should be campaigning or lobbying the FDA to make a decision one way or another. The FDA is a data-driven agency and, and they, they, they need the room in order to make those decisions based on the science. And it's not just the science presented in the application. You don't just submit a tobacco application 
and you're done. Uh, we've seen a lot of back and forth between uh, the Center for Tobacco Products and other manufacturers. Reynolds is still uh, amending their uh, modified risk application for uh, Camel Snoots. Uh, we saw a back and forth on ICOs. Manufacturers have these opportunities to uh, add things in order to address new questions from FDA as they're reviewing their applications. Uh, and so uh, as a science-based organization, they need the room in order to do that. Uh, but what we've seen in, in throughout this process, uh, first of all, the, the lawsuit from American Academy of Pediatrics has really thrown you know, a spanner in the works here. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've said this a couple of times on, on Kassaw's podcast, uh, and, and I, I hope I'm not the only person who believes this, but I, I think had the FDA been allowed to stick to that timeline of, of, of a 2022 deadline, uh, I think we would have seen a lot more of the agency uh, uh, implementing deadlines that are, that are bringing the industry along. Uh, and, and, and getting everybody closer to submitting robust applications that the agency felt confident in reviewing. Uh, but instead, everything got cut short. And so we're sort of left with just this big mess. You have an agency that was on a trajectory to get things done at a certain time, and now all of that's been moved up. And so they, they, everybody's got to call an audible and try to get things done. That's one potential explanation for it. The other explanation is uh, acting FDA commissioner, uh, uh, Janet Woodcock got hauled in front of Congress and berated for I don't know how long by you know activist uh, anti-tobacco uh, lawmakers at one point asking her whether or not she was familiar with the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee, which is something that was established by the Tobacco Control Act. It does include uh, members from the industry. They are non-voting members. Uh, if you've ever watched TIPSAC in action, uh, frequently the other experts around the table are asking the tobacco representatives questions, trying to learn more about the manufacturing process, toxi toxins, and all these other things. Uh, and so they're, they're a vital part to that committee. The questions seem pointed in a way to uh, uh, question the, the credibility uh, of TIPSAC as if it had been uh, co-opted by the, the tobacco industry somehow. Um, almost comparing it to the, the fake science organization that tobacco companies had back in the, uh, was it the 70s and 80s? Mm -hmm. I can't even remember the name of the organization. Um, so anyway, all of that to say, this uh, rule, <laughs> if we're calling it that, this new standard uh, may or may not have been implemented following that hearing. So this was FDA's response to a tremendous amount of political pressure, not just from Congress, but from all of the other anti-tobacco campaigns. And I, I don't know how else to say it, but that's that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. This right. is supposed to be a science-driven conversation. Exactly. And anecdotally, we've heard from you know industry representatives saying that, you know, up until a certain point, perhaps around the time of this hearing. Uh, there was a fairly, you know, legitimate back and forth between companies with applications and FDA, you know, in terms of deficiencies or supplying more materials. You know, it was a fairly friendly situation. And then suddenly until it wasn't. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, there is some, you know, timing that may coincide there. But it does seem like there was a very severe shift in attitude. And then we saw this sort of cascade of MDOs that came out. So, it is quite curious. I will be interested in following these lawsuits uh, to see what comes out, essentially. Yeah, I would say um, for, for those who are interested in reading some more details about it, Alex Norcia, N-O-R-C-I-A, uh, at Filter Magazine has covered this uh, recently um, with specifically to uh, the uh, FDA's switcheroo. Um, so some excellent reporting coming out of Filter from Alex Norcia and, and Helen Redman as well. Um, we don't we don't see a lot of this, you know, under any other circumstances, this would be a huge controversy. This is a scandal. Yes. Uh, and our, our mainstream media are not picking this up. Um, uh, it is it should be it should be well known that NBC in particular, uh, I believe, as a matter of policy, uh, has a bias against tobacco. Um, you can see that in some of their comedy writing and certainly in the way that they covered the lung injury cases in 2019, failing to mention FDA's updated uh, warning to consumers about THC, illicit THC cartridges. Um, and so, yeah, 
Um, but a lot of good coverage out of this, and we expect to see more details as more lawsuits are filed, as more companies are winning um, uh, stays or, uh, or, or getting their MDOs rescinded. Absolutely. And so how have the uh, tobacco control organizations in the United States been reacting to FDA authorizations? Um, with the typical amount of weird propaganda and, uh, and, and misinformation, and, and of course, uh, the, 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 they seem to be ramping up the pressure. Uh, and we, we just saw today uh, Congressman uh, Raja Krishnamurthy from Illinois uh, I guess coming out swinging and, and launching an investigation into synthetic nicotine. Um, uh, Representative Krishnamurthy and his uh, committee have sort of, uh, they have a track record of uh, dragging in uh, the, the PAVE moms and the PAVE, PAVE children uh, and uh, really, really not giving uh, the consumer side of this, the people who, who depend on these products to improve their lives, um, uh, equal representation or fair representation. That's how things go in Congress. If you're the, if you're the, the chair of the committee, you pretty much get to set the narrative. Uh, and that's exactly what they've done. Um, it is, it is entertaining if you can stomach it. Uh, it is horrible if you're on the receiving end of their misinformation like we are. Um, and, um, so yeah, ex we can expect to see more of that. I, I, I suspect the longer the FDA takes to deny uh, this is what they they want they want Juul's uh, PMTA to be denied. So the longer that takes, the longer the Juul is allowed to remain on the market, uh, the more and more these groups will be campaigning. Uh, we recently saw this horrible, misleading, uh, triggering, judgmental, all of the horrible words you want to put on it campaign from uh, the Truth Initiative with their depression stick. Um, total nonsense, total garbage. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, sort of the way that the Truth Initiative does their uh, their their campaigns. Uh, I think they got a little bit of money to 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 do some opioid ads at one point. Uh, they were horribly stigmatizing uh, and and largely misinformation. Uh, I can't imagine that that actually helped anyone. Uh, and certainly, their their tobacco marketing is 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 no better. Um, so yeah, that's just a just a sampling of some of the the uh, reactions and activities we've seen in response to this. Yeah, I think the main event is definitely going to be uh, whatever FDA ultimately does with Juul's applications. That's, I think. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Matt Myers from the Campaign for the Tobacco-Free Kids even said that essentially he put a clock on FDA and he's like, we're not waiting months for you know their decision on Juul's PMTA. So I would imagine that they will probably sue again and take them back to court um, if they don't get an answer soon. Yeah. So in terms of soon and what's coming next, uh, what exactly are we waiting for and or hoping for in this process coming next? Well, I'd say, you know, the waiting for is, is probably the easiest uh, to, to wrap our heads around, maybe. <laughs> waiting for things in, in the dark is, is often hard, but, um, you know, we're waiting to see, I think, more evidence of, of FDA's malfeasance here, um, FDA betraying a scientific process in favor of, of uh, appeasing politicians and, and prohibitionist campaigns. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, that 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 falls into the waiting side of things because it, it really is only a matter of time before all of this is exposed. Um, and and I, and the the hopeful side is that we do actually get a fair shake. Um, the the PMTA process from from the outset is not fair. Uh, it it was designed to create a bottleneck uh, and and prevent tobacco companies from uh, introducing new products to the market. Uh, I might be off base on this, but you know some of the early days uh, when the conventions were in full swing, and and you know uh, uh, we had everybody had their own YouTube show and, and reviewers and all kinds of stuff going on here. Um, it, the hype really drove the market. Uh, the ability to introduce new products, seasonal products, all of these things from a marketing perspective keep them in, in front of the eyeballs of, of people who, who want to buy these products. Uh, and, and, and more importantly, put them in front of people who are smoking 
uh, and might be looking for a safer alternative, or or maybe they're not looking, but they're certainly curious about a banana cream pie e-liquid that's going to taste worlds better than that cigarette they've been tied to for 20 years. Right. Uh, and so that that excitement really drove the market. Uh, but uh, the, the PMTA process, I mean, the Tobacco Control Act was written to to really clamp down on that and make it near impossible for a new product to come on the market. When you, if you talk to Matt Myers about it, you hear him talk about the Tobacco Control Act and all of the pathways that they've designed, you know, uh, preventing new products to come on the market was not their intent. They just want everything to go through a scientific review. That's the kind of like, that's the gaslighting and, and talking out of one side of your face kind of stuff that we can expect um, from, from, the, the, from the campaigns. Um, but, uh, you know, what the community has been asking for, the industry has been asking for, for, for more than a decade now is, is really just a fair shake. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's unfortunate that this is going to, this, it, it's going to require this issue rising to an undeniable level, uh, that, uh, activist groups, um, lose credibility, uh, and that 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 the you know it, it's it's sort of like you can't deny that water's wet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there are people out there who have tried. <laughs> um, there are I'm sure professional organizations out there that have stood behind certain positions, and when it rises to a level where it is absolutely undeniable that they are wrong, and they've doubled down and keep doubling, redoubling down, mm -hmm. they have to lose credibility. Right now, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, Truth Initiative. And all of the body parts groups, cancer, heart, and lung, they have amassed an enormous amount of credibility among politicians, among state and local health departments, and among the American public. Uh, that you know, even when you talk to critical thinking doctors out there, uh, and and specific to this, I remember telling a, a cardiologist about vaping, and um, and and uh, you know, after the evening was over, he went back, and and the first source that he went to was the World Health Organization. And, and I said, well, yeah, they, they have an opinion. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really correct, but um, sure. Um, and what, what he picked up on was, I think it, somewhere in there, they do actually acknowledge that, that e-cigarettes are less harmful than smoking. Um, so that's a good thing for them. But um, yeah, for, for doctors and, and politicians and lawyers and, and moms and dads, uh, these organizations are the gold standard for them in terms of, of how they're going to develop their opinion. And so um, I, I think I, I, I don't want to, I don't mean to set the bar unreasonably high, but, uh, you know, being a member of the crisis oriented human race, um, you know, the house is going to have to be on fire before somebody realizes that we've got to put it out. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I, I don't know that we can count on these organizations to do their part and, and correct the record. Um, but certainly that, I think, is, is a level that, that we're going to have to get to before this starts to turn around. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. Uh, I think a lot of people have likened it to, you know, reefer madness and, and other things, tactics that we've seen with the war on drugs and marijuana and all of these things. And it's just, you know... I, I remember hearing somebody talk, um, I think it was earlier today on a Twitter spaces about, you know, um, prohibitionists have always gone, you know, for the children, right? That's, that's the kind of excuse that they use to try to prohibit things, but it, it never ends up, you know, what the, the evidence that they use for that never ends up coming to fruition. It never, you know, bears out in real life. And yet it's still the go-to tactic. It's interesting. I'm sort of waiting for that day where we're vindicated and, you know, everybody gets a scarlet letter for being wrong on these things. Yeah. It's scarlet letter was running through my head the other day, but the other way around, like, I, I feel like I have a scarlet letter when I, when I go out in public that, you know, I'm going to be shunned for just for being a nicotine consumer. Yeah. Um, but uh, to, you, you noted the uh, Twitter spaces um, for folks. Uh, I, I, I promise I'm not just killing time here. We've got five minutes left um, and, and happy to take any questions. I can't see any any chat on YouTube. So if anybody's got any questions out there, if they can be relayed, we'll, we're happy to answer them in the last five minutes here. But uh, you brought up the Twitter spaces thing. Uh, I know Amanda Wheeler was on uh, yesterday 
uh, on this uh, live stream, uh, a, 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 a true champion for vapor products in the United States uh, and, and very appreciative of all of her work. Um, but uh, definitely check out the, uh, is it Vapor American? I think is the, the Twitter AVM. Handle. AVM, yeah. yeah um, the American Vapor Manufacturers. Um, or is it, yeah, American, AVM. Uh, check them out on Twitter and definitely check out those Twitter spaces. Uh, and most recently, um, she uh, posted up a tweet um, in response to Representative Yarmouth uh, from Kentucky who is responsible for putting the uh, vaping tax back into our Build Back Better Act. Um, and we're, we're here, uh, you know, working hard to make sure that that stays out of the final funding bill. Um, but noting uh, somewhat, you know, to, to your point about the children, uh, Yarmouth has been uh, a, a steadfast defender of the alcohol industry. Uh, and of course, uh, Kentucky known for its bourbon. Uh, and, and other uh, libations, and of course it's tobacco. Uh, and so it should not be a surprise that the representative from Kentucky put the, the e-cigarette tax language back in, but all of the other leaf tobacco taxes were left out. Um, also worth noting that alcohol actually does kill somewhere between three to 5,000 teenagers every year. Um, and uh, compare that to uh, the alleged harm caused by smoke-free nicotine products, uh, and you will see an obvious imbalance there in priorities. Um, so anyway, uh, just, you know, more points to illustrate. I think a lot of the hypocrisy that we experience here, uh, and unfortunately, it's not just from politicians. That's predictable and boring, uh, but when it comes from science-based regulators, it, it stings a lot more. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we could do an hours, an hours long panel on hypocrisy uh, and still not be done. So I did see uh, that we can see comments from YouTube. So yes. we've got three minutes here. Uh, did you see any questions pop up, Danielle? I have not seen uh, any, anything specific. I don't think uh, a lot of, uh, comedians in the chat. I appreciate yeah. their humor. <laughs> we do. We do appreciate the colorful audience that we have, not just here in the United States, but all across the world. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the themes here, of course, is that uh, the, the harms of smoking uh, affect everyone, no matter, you know, where you come from. Obviously, certain groups of, of people are, are affected uh, disproportionately uh, more than than the rest of the population, um, and um, but uh, maybe ending on a on a on a lighter note. We do appreciate your candor and uh, and good humor. Uh, you gotta laugh, or else you're just gonna spend all your days crying. Very true. I, Patrick, I will absolutely blame you for colorful language. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we wrap it up? I think that's it. Um, do you want to do the thank yous? Um, I would like to thank you, Alex, for being here with us. Um, I would like to thank those who organized uh, the Scope event for inviting us. And especially thanks to all of the viewers uh, who tuned in and uh, spent your, I'm not going to put a day or time on this because this is international. <laughs> so who spent the last hour with us um, listening and uh, looking deeper into tobacco harm reduction um, issues. So thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, a special thanks to Nancy Lucas uh, for being a, a very diligent organizer in all of this uh, and, and getting an international group of people together, uh, especially, you know, not just the, the obvious language barriers and all of that, but, but helping us sort out the time zones to make this thing uh, a success. Uh, much appreciation, much appreciation to the folks working backstage here uh, and, and putting all of this on. And, uh, and, and I don't know, maybe a, a, a hopeful thanks to any media uh, people who have been watching this and have your own questions. Uh, certainly you can send an email to us, uh, board at casa.org. Danielle and I both get those if you have uh, any need for comment uh, in covering COP9. Uh, and uh, again, thanks for everybody for watching and, uh, and letting us into your home or workplace or wherever you have your phone for the past hour. Um, thank you very much.